Welcome back. Okay, so we have next two speakers. The first one is Deng Xingdai. Yeah, he is a senior researcher from MPI for Informatics and a lecturer at ETH Zurich. He is the head of the research group vision for autonomous systems. His research interest lies in autonomous driving, robust perception, multimodal learning, multi-test learning, and object recognition under limited supervision. Okay, so let's welcome Deng Xingdai to give his topic. His topic is robust visual perception for all domains, domain synthesis, adaptation, and generalization. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Can, can you hear me well if I speak like this? Can hear clearly. Okay, perfect. Thank, thank you for the introduction. And thank you for inviting me to give a presentation at this uh, great workshop. So yeah, my name is Tenshin Dai as introduced. So just one uh, new information that I have recently joined Huawei Zurich Research Center from the, uh, uh, like uh, uh, last month. So, so, so basically, yeah, this is a new change. So I, I moved from uh, MPI already to Huawei. Okay, so my talk is about the uh, robust viral perception for all domains, domain synthesis, adaptation, and generalization. So the work is mostly done before I joined the company. So it's uh, um, it, it's just represent what I have, have done before, not what I'm doing now. Um, okay, so uh, if you check about the history about uh, vision, right? So we see like, uh, I know five, 500 million years ago, we have this big bang of uh, animal evolution. So when, when we have the eye, right? When the animal have the eye, we can actually start seeing. Then we have a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, the, the animal species actually increase a lot. So, but today we see actually, I would call a big bang of artificial intelligence. We see a lot of different intelligence system, including autonomous driving car, then all kinds of uh, ro uh, robots for for medical purpose and for other other uh, uh, like say assistant uh, uh, purpose. And then behind this uh, AI system, one very important function is to see right. Let the machine see this is what we call computer vision. Then there are there are a lot of tasks here. For instance, uh, to allow to assign the semantic labels to the pixel, to the point cloud, to detect the object, to track them, and also to predict the motion. I mean, we are all familiar about all these tasks, right? Um, at these days, we see that when we put this uh, the one the 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 most recent state of art like uh, the the algorithm onto the platform, we can see okay, this car can run auto autonomously on the public road. We see already enough this demo and the real cars on the road. The question we ask ourselves is, have we solved the machine perception, right? So is it already solved or is there still some remaining tasks that we need to focus on? So let's see, I mean, can we can we actually solve this 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 image? Let's say, given this image, can we solve it? If we give this to one of the standard neural networks these days that we can get very distant results, so you can somehow assume, okay, this, this kind of condition is solved. Then can we solve this and a different uh, city? Then of course it looks looks good. But then if you change to this kind of condition, let's say this rainy, heavy rain situation that we will see, okay, the result is really actually bad. If you if you train your model on clear weather, normal situation, if you try to apply to a different, more challenging situation, the result is bad. What about this one? The result also not good. So <clears throat> we the answer is that. We haven't solved the, the, the machine perception. So what what is the problem here? So let, let's actually look back a bit to see how our neural network is trained, right? So basically, we have to collect a lot of training data, annotate them, then design our neural network, then in between, we actually start our training, right? So we spend a lot of time designing this neural network, but of, of course, also collect the training data, right? So uh, in the literature, I mean, like uh, all the company, university, we have spent a lot of time to collect the data set. We have a lot, many great, very great data set there. But nevertheless, that we are limited by our resources, by our like, you know, you know, you know, the, the time we can put there. So all the data set have this confirmation, uh, it's not confirmation, the data set bias, right? So we see, for instance, cityscape, quite clear weather, actually only in Europe, mostly in Germany, and then my pillar also clear weather. So, so I mean, we have this, this kind of data set bias when we train something that we actually get used to or overfit to this condition. When we try to generalize to this rare, but also very important condition, we have issues, right? We cannot generalize well. So my talk is mostly about how we can gener generalize to new condition or how can we adapt to this new condition. 
So let's say if you have a condition where you have a lot of data, a lot of training data, here you want to train a model to adapt to new condition without further annotating new image from this new condition, right? That is actually our task. So this type of technology can be used to many situations. For instance, when you train something on the synthetic side, you would like to adapt or generalize to the real if you're from country A, for instance, in Asia, you want to generalize maybe to Europe or to Africa. And then let's say daytime, you would like to translate, uh, tra not generalize to nighttime, clear weather to bad weather condition or driving situation, maybe to a drone or some other different uh, application, but also from one sensor type from RGB, for instance, to thermal camera, for instance, that can also happen. Or from different, let's say, even it's the same type of sensor, maybe from one generation of the sensor to the next generation, right? If you have training data, for instance, for quite old LiDAR system, the next year or in the future, you have a new generation, you would like to also learn to adapt to the new sensor type. So there are many type of uh, 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 cases we need to adapt and we need to generalize. So how can we actually learn to generalize? So I've presented like four solutions that we have worked on. So they actually, when we put them together, you see like uh, some of them are more specialized, but their application range is a bit like, uh, let's say, rather limited. So uh, they are complementary to each other, depending on which state in which situation you have, you might want to choose different type of approach. So I will start with this domain synthesis, where you have full knowledge about your target domain. So the source domain, again, like you have a, uh, a lot of data you have, your, your, your samples that you can train here. A data distribution look like this, for instance. And then the target data, you know, the distribution is different. But here, the good thing is that you have a full knowledge about the target domain. You can have, you can write down the mathematical formulation exactly about the target domain. Then the good thing is that you can modify your data distribution, right? For instance, here I give you two examples, one about 2D image, one about the LiDAR point cloud. So for 2D image, this is something, this is a work I have done in, in like quite a few years ago with also Christos um, uh, Sakaridis, and he will also give a, a talk in this workshop. So where what we do is that we use, for instance, this a cityscape clear weather image, then we want to solve the foggy sea understanding. So in the foggy condition, the good thing is that we can actually, I mean, based on the literature, like people, all the, the other study people have done, we can write down precisely about how folk actually affect the lighting, like uh, the imaging process. So basically we can actually use this physics to simulate folk into this image. So, so here we modify the data distribution exactly to our target data distribution, right? So once this can be done, like uh, in, a, in a very controllable, like a uh, uh, um, precise way that you see here is a clear way that we can simulate different type of a different degree of uh, fog into this image from light to medium to, to dense, right? Then we can reuse the annotation that we have from the clear weather data set, for instance, from Cityscape. We have these pairs of training data. We can train a model, apply them to real data for object detection or semantic segmentation. What we can do further is that even for the unlabeled data, you can simulate, change the, modify the data distribution, change them to folk. Then you can have these pairs of data. You can enforce the semantic consistency between these two images that can further help you to improve the performance. This is kind of a semi-supervised learning. Uh, of course, by using this, that we can actually improve the performance for foggy understanding quite a lot without further annotating this foggy, real foggy image, right? That is like one example for 2D. Uh, but then after that, like, I mean, the literature people also like, uh, uh, um, Further done similar work for other conditions, for instance, for rain situation, people can simulate the rain into the clear weather image exactly to modify your data distribution uh, directly. And also there are very recent work, uh, very amazing work actually to simulate the glare right into the image so that you can really exactly modify your data distribution. So this is about the image side, right? For LiDAR, it's the same. So for instance, if LiDAR in clear weather situation, you see here is a foggy chamber uh, uh, chamber without fog. You see that you can see the road structure clearly. That's uh, actually very helpful for localization, for object recognition. That's all, all very good, right? But if you have fog, for instance, here, then you see two things happen, right? So one, the perception range is heavily reduced. You don't see very far away. Another one, you have a lot of noise. This is due to the reflection from the water drops in the air, right? You see a lot of uh, actually noise here. 
Uh, the data distribution again are different. So um, the good thing is that we have knowledge about uh, how actually fog affects the later emitting process. So we can actually modify the data distribution directly such that we can change this data to this type of data, right? That's what we did. So very quick overview about how LADA works, right? So basically you have a emitter, this is LADA, you shoot out one short beam of a, a, a light. Actually, when the light hit an object, it will reflect from here, right? And then you, you stop your clock, then you actually calculate how much time does it take for the LADAR fly until it reach the object, then you know the distance, right? That is just for one point measurement. But then when you put this LADAR onto something, this, this, this plate rotating very fast, then you can actually measure 360 degree. And then if you put multiple of them, let's say if you put 40 or, or 64 of this, uh, this, this laser, then you can measure like have really have a 3D scanning of the the, the whole environment 360 degree so at one time stamp for instance you can you can scan this profile profile of the environment for instance the tree the depth of this one point if you put this all together if you rotate like you know 40 of them together then you see this kind of point cloud there, there you see clear structure about car you can recognize if you see clear patterns then you can annotate data you can recognize them right you can train algorithm to recognize them the challenge here is that you see for clear weather, we see clear structure, the pedestrian, bus, car, it's, it's actually good, right? When you see them, when you see patterns, you can train your network to recognize them. But during like, for instance, adverse weather, you see here, you have a lot of noise, then the perception range is also reduced, as I said, as I said before, right? So we want to modify this. So uh, in this work, I mean, we have designed a method where we consider, for instance, uh, the sensor set up, then how the snowfall and, and fog actually affect the 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 the, 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 the LADAR imaging process, and then and putting this into this like a uh, mathematical form, then you can simulate, for instance, this. You see, perception range is reduced. You see here far, further away that the point, actually some of the point, you will not see them again because uh, the reflection of the snowflakes. And then here you see we actually increase a lot of noise due to the reflection. If the light, if the light actually hit on snowflakes, if you have a strong reflection, then you have a noise detection, right? Um, that's the basic idea. I show you a demo. This uh, as made by us by my, my colleagues that to demonstrate at a very high level how our approach works, right? So you have simulate this uh, snowflakes if. First of all, at the, in a 2D space where you see, okay, randomly distribution here, then you have, as I said, you have 40 or you have 64 like uh, uh, lasers, right? You, you basically have 64 slices uh, scanning the whole environment. If you put them together in like the 3D, 3D form that you have this, this kind of scanning, right? This is the field of view of the camera front view, let's say. And then what we do is that for every, uh, uh, laser light, then we calculate, okay, whether you will hit some snow, uh, snowflakes there. If you hit them, then we need to calculate, okay, you either you lose some energies and you continue uh, like uh, 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 going on, you, you will continue, or you actually have some energy like a strong energy reflect back, right? So you need to calculate how much energy will be reflected by the snowflake, how much energy you lose. In the end, we will calculate whether you still have enough energy hit the targets coming back or some of the snowflakes will be detected as a false object because the, the reflection is very strong, right? By doing this, as you can see, like this is a clear weather data, then this is a simulation by our approach and by an alternative approach, this is a real snowfall situation, right? What we can see here is that the simulation looks actually realistic. I mean, of course, here we don't have the exact same situation to compare because it's very hard to record the same situation both in sunny situation and in snowfall. Right? It's just two real road driving that we can have a rough you know, comparison. But the, the actual thing we want to evaluate is that if you train with this simulated snowfall, this modified data distribution, I remember, like. Uh, can we actually increase the performance of 3D object detection in real snowfall? That's something we want to verify. Then, then the good news is that actually we have a very good uh, improvement. For instance, here with our snowfall augmentation that you see, I mean, we can detect the object more accurately. 
and black is the predictions and this green is ground truth right so we have more accurate prediction and also we reduce the false positive a lot now, for instance in this case for this car uh, we are the only method which can which is able to detect this car which actually is uh, heavily affected by the snowfall and and, and and the fog right okay that's uh that's uh, uh this uh the first type of approach the second type of approach is that i mean of course we, it's, it's very nice we can have a right formulation about the target domain we can write down the detailed mathematic formulation but it's not always possible right there are some situations we cannot do this but the good thing is that even we, if we when we cannot write down the equation about this this data distribution but we can collect some images right we can collect some unlabeled image then we can learn let the neural network learn to modify the data distribution based on this uh, provided samples right that's actually what we call unsupervised domain adaptation so very quick overview about two group of methods for instance one is this adversarial linear method the idea is very very very, very interesting and, and straightforward you have the source source side the neural network to extract the features you have the target side neural network to extract the features for the source side, you will give to a kind of decoder to get the output and compare to your ground truth, you compute the loss. This is simple, right? For the, the target side, since we don't have annotations, so the way that they do is that we try to train a, a discriminator like a GAN, right? So you try to distinguish, okay, I try to classify, distinguish whether this image is from source or target, right? So this is the, the purpose of this discriminator then the feature extractor actually try to extract the feature such that both sides actually the distribution is properly aligned such that the discriminator cannot distinguish them so even if you have the best discriminator i extract the feature such that the feature distribution look more or less the same from both sides you cannot distinguish then actually the classifier or the, the 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 decoder you have trained for the source domain should work also for the target domain right that's the idea so this is actually a very popular idea, not only for semantic segmentation, but for detection, for classification, it's very popular. A second group of ideas, self-training, is even more straightforward. So you have the training data from your source here, some image, some annotations, then you evaluate, you just train a system, evaluate on your target domain. So there must be some pixels, some image that are easier to solve, right? If they are easier to solve, you can make some uh, like a prediction that you can actually pick up this uh, pixels where you make confident predictions then you assume okay this prediction are more like likely to be correct then i add them into my training data then this time my training data i have a mixture of uh, source domain and the target domain so somehow you know the data distribution is more defined is a bit closer to the target domain then you retrain your system you reapply them to the the, the, the target image and this time hopefully the performance will be better than you have more pixels that uh, are predicted to, uh, like a, 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 at a very confident level right then you can select more pixel ads uh, into your training data again to keep augmenting the training data so this is the idea so i mean the, the problem with this approach is that they are quite easy to get errors right so we have introduced multiple ways to actually reduce them for instance uh, we can actually have this curriculum idea instead of going directly from source to target we can actually go through multiple intermediate domain for instance from daytime to nighttime you can have some intermediate domain go them like gradually right uh, go to a, a slightly darker slightly darker darker then go to the, the even darker environment so this actually helps you to better adapt for the same idea for folk you can apply to folk or if you don't have this you don't cannot you cannot collect this you can synthesize the data actually intermediate domain synthesize them and help you to 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 go through the uh this whole self-training process um here i want to talk about i mean these are all like uh, the, the the whole literature mostly focused on this adaptation adversarial learning self-learning what we find is that they mostly focus on feature adaptation to align the local features or align the image appearance looks them uh, let them look similar but one important part is missing here is the context information so basically we haven't modeled the context information properly so one image about context information if you have for instance a person of the same size if you put into the image into different place 
then this person looks ridiculously large, right? But actually, it's the same mask. It's just in the wrong context information. So context information is really important for us to understand the, the, the image content. So it's the same for, we find it, it should be the same for unsupervised domain adaptation. So here we introduce like three contributions around this, uh, this topic. So the first one, the uh, novel neural network architecture to let us have the capability to learn more context information. Then second context information together with higher resolution details, I will show it a bit later. Then the third one is to really enforce the network to do the task, right? To do the job, to really learn it. So DA former is a CVPR uh, last year's paper where we actually use uh, the, the transformer. Uh, this is from a, a, a SecFormer's paper. That's uh, the, the first part, the encoder, multi-level transformer architecture. Then we also augment them with uh, this multi-level uh, dilated uh, future ideas for the decoder. So we reassemble the new architecture based on the uh, the, the transformer backbone and based on the decoder, this multi, you know, resolution uh, dilated filters. And then we have the, the, the new um, backbone. This actually have a, a, a really a significant boost compared to the backbone that people usually use for the, for uh, UDA for unsupervised domain adaptation. Here you can see we have a quite a dramatic improvement. Um, I will skip the details. And then the second part is that for UDA, I mean, for domain adaptation, you have multiple sources, you have a lot more image, a lot more loss to learn. Usually what people do is that they have to crop the image or they have downsample the image such that you can train them still, for instance, within a single GPU or with a limited amount of computing, computing resource, right? And what, what, what happens is that, for instance, if you downsample the image, you lose the details, right? High resolution details, then you cannot actually figure out the small object or some fine, fine structure, you will lose them. If you actually train, like, uh, let's say, with high resolution crop, then it's very nice. Details are here, but then you lose the context. Or so, sorry, this high resolution patch, but then you lose the context information, right? You don't actually have a chance to use the context information. What we find is that Compared to supervised learning, context information is actually even more important for domain adaptation, for unsupervised domain adaptation, because here the local feature is not that reliable anymore because the distribution has changed, right? So that's why context information actually is something more important that we should actually leverage. Uh, here we propose a new architect, this is a ECC paper last year, to let us actually learn like this, let's say, for domain adaptation, for let, let us actually leverage both, you know, like the high resolution details, but also, you know, the, 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 the user adaptation, like the, our, our, our DA former backbone, right? So the idea we do is that we do one high resolution crop and one low resolution, like down sampling, right? Low resolution down sampling, let us learn the context information, high resolution uh, crop, let us learn the high resolution details, right? So we actually want to learn both, go through the same encoder. The segmentation has to make a prediction. You see here the high resolution detail, actually the prediction only for this part, right? Then the rest, you don't have prediction. Low resolution actually have prediction for the whole image, but they are quite, you know, like a rather coarse prediction, right? Then we have to fuse them. So when we fuse them, the, the, the good thing is that we learn this attention maps that to learn, okay, for this part, should we trust more on the low resolution prediction or high resolution prediction? Because for some objects, the high resolution is more important. For some others, the context information is more important. So this is a dynamically learn to fuse these two branch. When you fuse them, we have the the uh, the, the prediction that we compare to the you know compare to the uh, ground truth and compute the loss, right? So this is a, a design. By doing this, actually, we can really benefit from context information. And in the meanwhile, we don't lose uh, the high resolution details. <clears throat> you can see here the low resolution prediction, high resolution prediction. And this is a fused prediction that we can actually correct the mistake made by either of these two. And, and then uh, with this, we actually improve, really have consistent improved over multiple type of you like a domain adaptation approach and also improve over multiple type of uh, backbone networks you see we have a really consistent improvement um 
the, the question we thought, okay, are we done with context information in, in like modeling? That's something we, we, we after the HDA, uh, HRDA, we are thinking about, okay, are we done with the context information <clears throat> modeling? When we check about the experiment result, for instance, here, we find networks still making mistakes. For instance, the road, a sidewalk, they can still, you know, they cannot reliably distinguish this true. So because the local texture are more or less similar, right? The only way is to distinguish is to use context information. We find, okay, now we have the DA former, which we have the capability to learn it. We have HRDA to also learn like uh, the high resolution details, but is this still not enough, right? So we are thinking about what is the reason. We find that network is lazy, right? They have the capability, doesn't mean that they will really do the job, right? So um, what we did here for this CVPR paper this year is actually we forced the network to really learn context, really use context information. So the idea is also simple. We use this masking image idea. This is a target image, let's say. We just randomly mask out, let's say, 70% of the patches. Then we use this uh, partial information to still predict the, the semantic map for every pixel, right? The full semantic map. So you can imagine like for here, you have local information, you can use local information, but for here, we don't have local information. You have to rely on the context information from other provided by other patch, right? So for example, we really force the network to use context information. That is the idea. I mean, here is a more the complete diagram, but it's also quite straightforward. For the source side, you have the network to extract feature, it has source prediction, you compare to the target, uh, compared to ground truth, Compute the loss for the target image, then it's a bit more like involved, right? So first of all, you go through the network, you have the prediction of the whole image, then you, I mean, you can actually, you know, you, you can have this adaptation loss, as I said, either server loss or something, but on the, like, uh, on top of that, we actually masking out this image. We make the prediction here for this uh, partial labels, right? Oh, sorry, that's a uh, partial label is here. Then we compare this results to a result predicted by using the full image, right? So we want to enforce the consistency. Then this way, this network actually have to use context information. Uh, this is a, this is a way that we improve the network. Uh, by doing this, we actually find that we improve again, like have very consistent improvement, not only for for semantic segmentation, but also for object detection, classification, or multiple benchmark, or multiple, you know, uh, different. Uh, uh, domain adaptation method. That's a, a, a very good news. So we have code and paper available if you want to check, you can check the details there. Here's some, just some results to show, okay, you have image, our DA former, HRDA and uh, our MIC that to really force the network to learn the context information. You see that we have a really uh, good improvement. When we put all these three work together, you find, okay, I mean, here's the previous state of art Then you see for different benchmarks, synthetic to real, synthetic to real, day to night and clear weather to, to you know, to, to bad weather situations. And we have, we can see we have a very significant improve or improvement over previous approach. But we, for our three approach, we also have incremental, uh, uh, uh improvement uh, that are, are quite significant. This is a very, very good, uh, very great. So very quickly, like I will summarize very quickly about the other two line work. I wouldn't go to uh, like uh, would not present uh, too much details. Um, for the second group, this unsupervised domain adaptation, we assume that we can collect quite many samples about target domain, right? But in some application, maybe you don't have the chance to collect to wait and collect that many many samples. That uh, maybe the target domain is evolving, is keep changing, right? Let's say if you have a car you drive out. Maybe you have a static uh, uh, domain, let's say it, it could be nighttime, but sometimes let's say if you enter a tunnel, you, in, you enter it, you, you, when you leave it, then the domain actually keep changing, right? You only have probably have the one instance of the sample there. You want to use this one instance to actually refine your model to do the adaptation online, right? Um, this is what we call test time domain adaptation. It's a kind of a new research area, not, not very new, but relatively new research area. Uh, we have uh, two works in this line. One is the CVPR last year, then one is the ICRA uh, this year. So the idea is that you train the model with your source domain that you want to adapt in this uh, testing environment. 
So we solved two problems. One is the instability of training. You Since you already have one single sample, you want to actually have a more reliable training. Another one, you try to avoid the forgetting issue, right? So if you actually keep adapting, adapting, or sometimes that you will forget what you have learned before, these are two important problems we have actually uh, provide ways to address them in these two papers. I, I actually skipped the, the details. So I want to show here is that by adapting, for instance, you start from here, right? This is an uh, error for depth estimation, for instance. At the beginning, I mean, when we compare to other methods, every method is doing a quite good job. But as time goes, you see when the environment changes that in this real driving situation, then the performance of every algorithm actually drops a lot. So, but our approach actually uh, and perform the best, but still, you know, every approach actually making mistakes. So there are still a lot of room for further improvement in the in the future in this line. The last group, uh, I mean, this is also a very big research domain. People people research area people call domain generalization. So <clears throat> you have the target domain that uh, annotation you train this, but for the uh, sorry, this is source domain. For the target domain, you either you don't have the knowledge to write down the equation. You don't even know what is the target domain. You also cannot collect the training samples from that target domain, right? You have no knowledge about what kind of domain you will have. So you, the best thing we do is we train something robust enough and general, generalizable enough to generalize to all kinds of different target domains. That's uh, what we call uh, generalization for uh, domain generalization. So, I mean, we know here, like uh, normally we have training sample, we design our neural network, convolutional network or, or transformer based networks and we have our output. One thing we find is it's kind of actually really, I mean, it's important component, but very actually easy to let network overfit to the target, uh, to the source domain is uh, 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 normalization layer. This is also found by other researchers in the previous work is that this normalization, like for instance, the batch normalization, they help us to be to 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 have a more reliable training, to train much deeper network. But the problem is that this parameter that you have learned in this batch normalization, they can be very much data set dependent. So uh, when you train, uh, for instance, daytime, and you try to generalize nighttime, it doesn't work because uh, the batch normalization layer actually quite, so this parameter are, let's say, data set dependent. What we do here is that when we train this, we let the network learn these two parameters but then we actually randomly add some Gaussian noise there so that you somehow have a more reliable training adapt to the, the, the like somehow have a more, more reliable data distribution. But we also don't let you, let's say, overfit to that data distribution. We actually add some perturbation such that in the future, if you see something different, the network has still handle, right? This easy modification helps us very, a lot that we evaluate for object detection in real world uh, domain shift. This is the iClear paper this year. You can check about details. The last work I want to present is also CVPR paper this year about the uh, hierarchical grouping transformer for generalization, uh, domain generalization. So what we find is that, okay, we first think about why is the neural network are not super like robust, right? If you add the, if you apply them to a new domain, that the prediction of the semantic segmented mask will be wrong. What we find is that we actually are making prediction more or less like based on the pixel-based classification idea. Right? That's a mainstream of idea. Then, for instance, the mask transformer actually started thinking of, okay, we can actually make a mask then uh, make the prediction or classification based on the mask, right? We, we took this mask uh, transformer idea then make us like a push it uh, even further. So, what we did here is that you have image, then we have this mask, for instance, for the object path, path first, then we have hierarchical grouping, further group them to like object level mask, you know. So we have paths, we have a whole level mask, have hierarchical masks, then we actually run the classification actually based on this mask, right? When you, when you can group them pixel together, then you can make a more powerful, more reliable classification because this is also how human do it, right? If you do per pixel classification, it's very, it's not that, that that's robust, right? That's the idea. Then we have a full end-to-end -end trainable transformer for grouping and classification all together in this work. So uh, we will also share our code and you can also find the details uh, in our paper. If you come to CVPR, uh, you are welcome to talk to us uh, on site. I just show one result here. You see, when you trained our clear cityscape uh, set, data set, we evaluate on this noisy situation, 
for instance, mask true former, which is one of the state of art uh, approach, actually uh, still making mistake in this situation. That our work is, let's say, um, uh, actually have a more reliable grouping, and also, uh, of course, this more reliable grouping also benefits for the final classification results, a, a more accurate, reliable prediction. And then, of course, we evaluate our different benchmarks, and we have a. Uh, um, improvement compared to the recent for the sec former mask true former we actually have more robust uh, or, or, or better capability in terms of generalization okay then i would conclude my talk here so i i actually mentioned the importance of adaptation and generalization in different situation i presented like this four group of approach that we have done in the past few years so every type of approach have their strengths and limitation, especially like uh, when the, uh, the right setting, like the some settings that are more suitable for, 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 for some approach where you have more knowledge about the target domain, some settings are more, let's say, general, um, but they are less specialized, right? So uh, depending on the setting, you can choose the, the right type of approach that uh, I hope that uh, you have enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. If you have questions that uh, if you still have time, then I, I'm very happy to take some of them. Thank you. Okay, cool. It's really a nice talk. Do you have any like questions? Okay, maybe so due to the time we I, I can ask one quick question. So I, I, mm -hmm. I see you you have mentioned that you test the, the domain generalization ability with some like snow uh, corruptions. Mm -hmm. So you also have like snow simulation or snow syn synthesis yeah. works for your LiDAR mm -hmm. corruptions, I mean. So do you, mm -hmm. do you, so my question is, so can you like generate, generalize your algorithms to your previous snow synthesis works? And uh, like the, the point is, what do you think about the benchmark for current domain generalization? Yeah, do, is there uh, any? Yes, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, the generalization, for instance, I. Benchmark actually I had the slide, but I thought the time is not enough. So let me let me quickly show you some of the yes, in terms of benchmark, we have one is a 2D SETC. Maybe some of you have already started using. So this is 2D. We have created a real benchmark with 2D image, like a snow, rain, nighttime, uh this challenging situation for 2D semantic segmentation uh in our our in our our ICCV paper, but now we have uh, extended them to extended them to uh, uh, um, also instance uh, in segmentation and object detection that we are we we already have the challenge uh, released that people can already use the data. So this is a real real benchmark. That another one that you have made a good point. So we have this snowfall simulation for weather condition, but then we also actually consider other types. There are also other type of uh, noise or, or or domain shift. You know. We actually presented this more comprehensive uh, uh, synthetic benchmark where we simulate, okay, for instance, for this laid up point cloud, that the different type of noise weather due to weather situation, due to different type of LiDAR sensor, also due to the, 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 the measurement, maybe the, let's say the calibration error or distortion. So different group of noise. And there we can evaluate, for instance, existing or existing like a method where like which one which design, which kind of choice actually are more robust to which type of noise. In the end, what we find is that there are actually are certain designs that are more robust to general every type of noise. So when we actually take the best part of multiple of this approach, reassemble a new approach. So we can actually have a method which is which, which perform very well for the training domain, but also more robust to different type of uh, uh, data uh, uh, distribution. So this is also possible. So so in order to answer your question directly, so we can we can think of having a more comprehensive uh, benchmark, have different type of noise. Maybe even better is that the evaluation, the, the type of noise used in the evaluation shouldn't be visible during the training time so that we can know, okay, if your method actually are trained to be robust to, I don't know, to rain and fog, then if I show you nighttime during my test time to see whether you are still robust to that, right? So we definitely need to have more comprehensive, including a diverse set of uh, uh, data uh, corruptions, but also better to have some unseen 
uh, uh, corruptions uh, uh, in your training process? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That answers my questions. Okay. Uh, so no mm. questions, no. Okay. Another applause for the doctor Deng Xindai. Thank you for your awesome talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the time. For thank, you, the time. thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you.